During the late 1960s and throughout the 70s and early 80s, Dean Kenyon was one of the leading chemical evolutionary theorists in the world. And like others in his field, he was trying to explain how life on Earth began through a purely natural process. At the time that biochemical predestination came out, I and my uh, co-author were totally convinced that we had the scientific explanation for origins. Many scientists embraced Kenyon's ideas. And over the next 20 years, biochemical predestination became a best-selling text on the theory of chemical evolution. Yet five years after the book's publication, Kenyon quietly began to doubt the plausibility of his own theory. It was during that whole period of time that my doubts about certain aspects of the evolutionary account became apparent. When coming into contact with a powerful counter-argument given to me by one of my students, and I could not refute that counter-argument. Kenyon was challenged to explain how the first proteins could have been assembled without the help of genetic instructions. And so my doubts about whether amino acids could order themselves into uh, meaningful biological sequences on their own without pre-existing genetic material being present just reached, uh, I guess for me, the intellectual breaking point uh, sometime near the, the end of the decade of the 70s. As Kenyon reevaluated his theory, new biochemical discoveries further weakened his conviction that amino acids could have organized themselves into proteins. The more I conducted my own studies, including a period of time at NASA Ames Research uh, Center, uh, the more it became apparent that there were multiple difficulties with uh, the chemical evolution account. And uh, further uh, experimental work showed that amino acids do not have the ability to order themselves uh, into any biologically meaningful sequences. Faced with mounting difficulties in his own theory and a growing body of scientific data about the importance of DNA, Kenyon was forced to confront the absolute necessity of genetic information. The more I thought about the alternative that was being presented in the criticism and the enormous problem that all of us who worked on this field had neglected to address, the problem of the origin of genetic information itself, then I really had to reassess my whole uh, position regarding, uh, regarding origins. Chance, natural selection, and his own theory of self-organization had all failed to explain the origin of genetic information. Now Kenyon saw only one alternative. We have not the slightest chance of a chemical evolutionary origin for even the simplest uh, of cells. So the concept of the intelligent design of life was immensely attractive to me and made a great deal of sense as it very closely matched the multiple discoveries in molecular biology. In the years since Kenyon's rejection of chemical evolution, science has revealed the details of an entire system of information processing that bears the hallmarks of intelligent design. Do many of your colleagues support your new position? Well, most of my colleagues, uh, I would have to say the majority of them, are, are not in support of, uh, of my views on origins, my new views on, on origin, first life, and, and uh, on evolution. Um, there are some of those who uh, are also not in support of my uh, being able to uh, discuss these matters in, uh, in class. Um, there are a few who are sympathetic uh, to uh, an open and free uh, discussion of these matters, although not all of those are sympathetic to, the, to my views themselves. A couple are. Now, I'm not, not the only one who, uh, uh, in the science faculty here who would uh, have views like I do about origins. As to why there is this um, attitude on the part of the faculty, uh, I'm not sure that I could give a a quick answer. I mean, you have to ask them, of course, but uh, I think deeply ingrained habits of thought is a, is, is a factor. Uh, when one has been uh, trained uh, 
to, to uh, accept uh, and to really be only aware of uh, one particular explanation of origins, the Darwinian account and the standard ev chemical evolutionary material, uh, and not ever having read a single critical paper, or certainly not having read a single article defending intelligent design, uh, perhaps it's not surprising that uh, there would be this kind of uh, reluctance to, to support this. I suspect that some of them may themselves suspect that a rather major uh, reorientation of thinking would follow if uh, they were to give serious consideration to, to, this, to the literature on this subject and have said, well, I just don't want to do that. Um, it, it, it's going to involve uh, something that I'm not prepared to do in the way of major uh, reassessment of uh, some parts of biology, although much of, I believe much of biology will, will remain intact. Why is an intelligent design or creationist interpretation of the scientific data not acceptable to many scientists? Well, I think we have here an example of, um, again, the, uh, the deeply ingrained habits of thought uh, that are connected with, uh, with Darwinism and neo-Darwinism and this commitment to uh, uh, philosophical naturalism that the the only permissible uh, explanations in science are those that involve uh, observable and testable natural processes. And um, when you move into the area of intelligent design, although you argue to intelligent design through a, uh, a dense field, if you will, of empirical data, and it's only after uh, extended encounter with those data that you come out at the end with an intelligent design conclusion, nevertheless, it makes many scientists uneasy because uh, this is uh, a thought of, this causal causation, intelligent causation, as ultimately untestable by the uh, traditional methods of, uh, of science. So if you define science as, as, as um, excluding the possibility of intelligent cause at the outset, then any proposal that uh, is made, however many data back it, is uh, ruled out of court. Uh, as, from the beginning, so. Does academic freedom allow you to discuss the difficulties of Darwinism and scientific naturalism? If not, why is Darwinism and naturalism protected from criticism? Well, ideally, academic freedom should allow one to discuss uh, the difficulties not only of Darwinism, but of any scientific theory. Why should this be so? It may have uh, something to do with uh, cultural dominance. It may be an issue of power. Um, it, um, in order to uh, allow an equal voice to the intelligent design um, uh, position, uh, one has got to share the stage with, uh, with a view that uh, it may be anathema to, um, uh, to the uh, scientific establishment. And, uh, and yet to do this would, would I think, greatly assist uh, the, the progress of, um, of research on this, uh, this vital area of origins, um, which, after all, is, is, a, is a most difficult problem and could, could benefit from, 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 uh, in, from an open and vigorous uh, debate. In Kenyon's interviews, we get an insight into the pressure within academic circles there is to go along with evolutionary theory without questioning. Scientists hide behind such statements as the supernatural cannot be used as an explanation for any event or process in the universe. Everything can be explained by natural events. Note, this is a philosophical, not a testable scientific statement. Science should be about discovering the truth, and it does seem unscientific not to consider all the possibilities. Evolutionists will continue to modify their theory to try to keep it viable in spite of the impossibility of the information and in DNA coming about without a creator. Kenyon realized this only after being challenged by a student and was able to break free of his academic indoctrination. God is in communication with his creation. The information in DNA is God's instructions to his creation how to sustain itself until he returns. How much more important is the information that God has given to us in the Bible? With this information, we have the choice to free ourselves from sin and have a relationship with our Creator God through Jesus Christ. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22.